All right, Jerkoffs, we are back. Back with another episode from Australia, coming in hot from Maroubra in Sydney, where it's finally sunny. I've been here for like over a week. It's been kind of just real average temperature. And I'm like, this is bullshit. I'm not getting my money's worth. But now, finally, it's kicking off. I'm recording this thing upstairs in my girlfriend's house. My girlfriend's parents' house. She doesn't have a house. I wish. I wish I was marrying to that kind of money. Uh, but yeah, I'm upstairs here. There's a bunch of children downstairs running around yelling at each other. Someone's carving a pumpkin because that's what's happening in Australia. We have completely deviated from copying UK culture. Now we're fully American. We've got the pumpkin being carved. Uh, even though it gets dark so late here during this time of year, it's pretty pointless to have a jack-o'-lantern. But hey, that's where we're at. That's where I'm at. I just got back from Brisbane where I did three shows at the sit-down comedy club, which is their big comedy club up there. Uh, it, was, it, it felt like Brisbane because even though it was like indoors, the chairs they had for the club were like that kind of outdoor, kind of woven look. I don't, know, I don't know why they decided that was the look for the chairs of their comedy club, but it definitely had kind of like a big deck, like a big Queenslander house deck feel. And uh, that was cool. I was up there. Um, and now I'm back in Sydney for the rest of my shows. They're all in Sydney, including my big show at Giant Dwarf on November 8th. If you know anyone or if you live in Sydney, please do come along and check that out. Tickets are at my website, www.danielmuggleton.com. And one thing I just want to say, thank you so much to some, to some Union Jackoff listeners, to some Jerkoffs, because I don't know if you know, I guess from episode two, Liverpool's Adam Rowe. He was on tour. He's still on tour because he's a busy boy. And he did a show in London on Saturday night. And three of you guys went along to the show because of the episode. He was stoked. He got in touch with me. He had a big show at Leicester Square Theatre, which is like a very prestigious, monstrous theatre in London. And a bunch of Australian people were in. And he was like, how did you, how did you find me? Are you Liverpool supporters, you big Harry Kuehl fans. And they were like, nah, man, the Union Jackoff with Daniel Muggleton. And he was like, holy shit. So... Thank you so much for going and checking that out. Um, I, I appreciate that. And he does as well. Because, um, you know, these guys, they come on the show, they have a chat, and it's always nice that you are interested enough to then go see them do stand-up, which is obviously the thing that they enjoy the most. Um, beyond that, if you are in London, uh, this Sunday is another Australian comedy show. We do the Australian show the first Sunday of every month at the Backyard Comedy Club in Bethnal Green. And this Sunday, we've got Tom Cashman, Ray Badrin, and Heidi Regan. They've all won a bunch of awards. They've pretty much all been on TV. Like, it's a real heavy-hitting lineup. I will not be there because I'm still in Sydney, but you can go check that out. 8 p.m. November 4th at the Backyard Comedy Club. It's called Australian Comedians Dope Comedy. Australian Comedians slash Dope Comedy. So you can remember it like ACDC, the famous Australian band that I have seen live. I don't know why I saw them live, but I did. It was pretty good. I think every Australian person is just kind of like a rite of passage. You go see ACDC live for some reason and you'll enjoy it. You know, it's familiar. Like you'll get some Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 soundtrack action. You'll get some like footy highlights soundtrack action and you know, you'll enjoy it. You won't have a bad time, but you know, I definitely forget often that I have seen ACDC live but i definitely have i was there um when i was like 19 20 i don't know something like that anyway um australia's been good it's been interesting to be back you kind of you kind of forget but I, i've been distracted this week just because i've injured my neck i don't know how i went to i went to a doctor and they were like you have all the symptoms of whiplash have you been in a car accident and i was like no uh, I have walked for over an hour today, though, wearing a backpack. Could that be it? And they were like, Jesus. And I was like, yeah, that's where my health is at, apparently, at this point. But the fun thing about any kind of back injury, I don't know if any of you guys have had this, that any kind of back or neck or shoulder is just that everybody has an opinion and nobody is a doctor. It's a, it's a hell of a time. It's like when any of my friends like kind of circle around a car that doesn't work. We have no idea how cars work. We have no idea why cars stop working, but God damn it, do we have an opinion. 
we've definitely got a solution and everybody knows a chiropractor that you know usually yeah of course i agree chiropractors they're no good they're cowboys they're maniacs but this guy this guy dan he's the best guy all right you don't want to go to any guy apart from this guy all the other chiropractors kill people but my guy he cured me by just slapping me on the cheek that is a verbatim quote from my dad he's like i had the exact same thing as you and what my chiropractor did was just slap me on the cheek and then he demonstrated that and he was like oh geez yeah i can feel it exactly in my shoulder just like before and then <laughs> I, I can't believe this is actually true my dad spent this afternoon he gave it three goes just slapping me on the cheek trying to cure my neck pain uh it didn't work obviously but after the second slap he was like do you feel anything and i was like yes i feel someone's hand hitting me in the face so that's where i'm at at the moment i can't really turn to the right but please don't tell anyone i'm still driving every now and again to get to gigs but whatever uh i'm sure it'll sort itself out um and i'm not gonna if honestly if if you if you got some back knowledge if you if you got like the exact same thing everybody seems to have an opinion on this do get in touch with me at dan muggleton on twitter and instagram or daniel muggleton on facebook or you can get at the union jack off facebook page as well um i'm you know i'm I'm hearing it from everybody i may as well hear it from you guys as well um all right let's get into today's guest today's guest is alice fraser now alice fraser uh, i still think of her in my head as alice comedy fraser because that was her her comedy website it still is i'm pretty sure a comedy website um alice was someone that i met really early on um through sam kettler who i started mug and kettle comedy with uh, that was kind of how i got into comedy uh, my friend and i we started this open mic room in sydney it was the first one ever uh in sydney and maybe in australia that had sign up on the night uh spots that's kind of how it worked. you just turn up on the night you were guaranteed stage time and now there's one of those like every night in sydney it really kind of took off pretty well but yeah he, he introduced me to alice because they i think well i know this is going to sound like a weird way to put it but this is how he describes it uh they're both jewish so it's just a shitty jewish connection uh that's that's his word for it i don't know if if i'm allowed to say that but that's definitely how he describes it um so yeah they just kind of knew each other and then um when i started doing comedy she was really helpful because she was a bit further along than me um and yeah she was always just really sweet in terms of giving me advice uh giving me stage time uh, i remember the first time i went to the melbourne international comedy festival which is a pretty big deal uh, for an australian comic that was to kind of flyer and open for her um because she had her show there and she wanted me to help like she was like no, no no you should come down like don't worry i'll get you some stage time i'll introduce you to some people you can open my show um and then i went down and i saw her show and i was like alice look it's really lovely that you've asked me to do that but you know you've got this great song about a talking banjo and i talk about dicks a lot so i think probably open with the banjo song and uh i'll just i'll just chill out and fly for you and stuff like that because the com the, the styles didn't really gel and you guys, I think when you hear us talk, you'll, you'll be like, oh yeah, I don't think, I don't think they're a natural fit comedically, uh, but we, we do get on really well and we do have very similar backgrounds in terms of our education uh, and uni and the law and like the kind of family setting. And yeah, it's quite interesting how if, if you didn't know that, you would, you would definitely not think that watching our acts. But yeah, Alice has always always been really helpful to me and any comedian really. Like she's one of those people whose door is always open. Um, and the other thing is she is so hardworking and she has really kind of created this this like I don't know, like an aura around her almost. Like in in Australia, she like really has pushed through these very ambitious festival shows. Like this year's one, I didn't, I didn't get to see it. I've seen all the others, but this year's one includes a robot. You know, like this is the kind of level she's, she's at. Like she's pushing through these ambitious festival shows. She's writing for TV and then she's just spending more and more time in the UK because her, her style of comedy is definitely um, better accepted, I guess, in the UK. So that's why I was excited to talk to her because, you know, a lot of people kind of take the plunge on the uk for a professional reason but alice has just kind of spent more and more time there basically due to demand 
like people in the UK just want her around more and more and more and more. So yeah, I'm, I'm curious to talk to her about that. And also because she, her first experience of the UK was going to Cambridge University um, when she was still going down the law track. And I was curious to see kind of, because Cambridge, if you haven't been, is a weird place. Like I'm sure she'll be able to describe it better than me. But yeah, like how she kind of dealt with that as her first impressions of the UK and is now kind of like living in London like a normal person, <laughs> which is just the complete opposite of uh, what you'd experience as a Cambridge student. Anyway, I want to I want to get I want to get to chatting to her. Um, always always interesting to talk to Alice. She always has big ideas and well thought out like opinions, which is kind of the opposite of me. So I enjoy it a lot. Um, yeah, Australia. I'll keep you guys updated. But if you do know anyone, please do send them along to that Sydney show at Giant Dwarf on November eighth. It would be cool to have some podcast listeners there. But more than anything, thanks for going to Adam Rose show because that felt fucking great. Anyway, here's Alice Fraser, uh, the Union Jack Off. Hope you guys enjoy it. Right. I always feel comfortable around you. I mean, that I hope is true. You're an immensely non-threatening man. Thank you. I think. (laughs) Does this mean I'm going to get overlooked in boardroom situations? Oh, you can work on your negotiating skills. Really? Do you want to be threatening? I guess as a dude, surely there's like something positive about... Wait, when you say, do you want to be threatening, you do mean, does one want to be threatening does, does... or do I personally want to be threatening? Well, I assume you, you carry a... You I'm carry inherently a... threatening. That's what I think, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyone, anyone who doesn't <laughs> drink at parties is threatening. That's something <laughs> that I've, I've learned as I've gotten older. If you don't drink at a party, I'm threatened by you because you will remember everything. And I've worked very hard to forget some things. Yeah, know? but I'm also, you know, I defend myself from being threatening in that situation by never being at parties. You've, I've seen you. I've seen you at like an artist bar late at night, just in a place where a sober person should not be. You know, yeah. like it's, it's I tend impressive. to stay for about five minutes. So people are like, oh, yeah, Alice was there. And then I leave. You have told me the strategy before, which I quite like. Yeah. It's just like, she's never there. No, she is. I saw her. Just yep. like for how long? About a minute. <laughs> yep. I just go like, in, I say hello to people, I leave. I hope that you like go to the bathroom because I figure like the bathroom line is like where you're most <laughs> recognized, you know? Like <laughs> even as a dude, like that's that's when you remember who was there, like who did you pee with, like who was waiting at a urinal. I can't say that is my strategy. Also, women do not uh, tend to use the cubicles. So yeah. there's only the kind of the makeup in front of the mirror segment. Okay. But like there's the the hand wash, the the cue. The, I thought I thought the female version would be more of the cue as less of the urinal stand. Yeah, yeah. It is the cue. There are there are very long queues outside women's bathrooms. Just all the time? Majority of the time, uh there are few uh, as many women's ba- toilets as there are men's and women tend to take longer and each uses an individual stall rather than any kind of urinal That's efficiency true. situation. <laughs> you you got you guys got to sit whereas we just we just have to shake. Yes, exactly. And Although you don't have to sit. But we can. There are no 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 we 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 don't have to sit. There are strategies. You can stand. Yeah, or sort of crouch. Like the hover. Yeah. I know about the hover. Come on man, I'm in a I'm in a long-term thing with a lady. I know about the hover. <laughs> if you're talking to me when I was 22 I'd be like what's the hover? But now I'm like, yeah, of course. You know it. Sometimes, yeah, I have a I have a friend who like insisted she was a, she was a lady who was like quite a feminist lady and she would insist on like fighting the patriarchy by pissing in a lot of pot plants. <laughs> in bars just because she'd refuse to wait she's like i'm not waiting i'm a woman i'm gonna piss in this pot plant i mean I'm like, that's bev killick levels of yeah well she she's like she's rec- she's just claimed being a loose unit right that's like bev killick bev killick's brand is being a loose unit and she will often or regularly enough for it to be a thing do end up doing a wee or a poo in a gutter somewhere in a in a gutter yeah but outdoors. a poo in a gutter I haven't seen that. You haven't seen that? Well, I hope you haven't seen it. it. I've heard of it. I hope like if someone's take if, if a lady's taking a shit in a gutter, I hope they construct a cubicle around her <laughs> to like prevent as many people as possible from seeing that. Because that's well, not something anyone wants to see. There's that scandal in, in France at the moment about the outdoor urinals. Wait, isn't that the ones they have here where it's like kind of the central like kind of thing and then there's like four dudes yeah. making eye contact with each other? Yeah, so yeah. They're, but they're sort of introducing them in France in the city of right. outdoor urinals with no kind of boundary between the 
and people are, people are mad. People are mad at seeing that butt. Yeah, well, some people say that it's, you know, they don't want men with their wangs out in public, um, which is generally <laughs> frowned upon. I think most countries are pretty fine with that rule. So let's just keep the wangs away. <laughs> oh, that, that sounded like a border control thing. Well, yeah, Ugh. and, and there's, uh, you know, yeah. all of these delightfully false analogies being made, as always, like, oh, so many false analogies in the public discourse at the moment, but that, you know, how can you object to men doing wheeze in public urinals if you are pro-breastfeeding in public and all kinds of things? I mean, that's not the same. No, that's not. Boobs so many are, people think are cool. things are the same. same. Dongs are not cool. <laughs> I like calling them dongs every now and again. You call them what you want to call them. I think dong implies more girth than dick. You know what I mean? It's a dong. <laughs> like it's got some more base to it. I, uh, but a dick is longer. I took my <laughs> I dad to the Edinburgh Fringe this year. He came for the last week of the Fringe. Um, did, and I, did I bump into you You might have him? met my dad, I yeah. I think so, yeah. I and was like, that's a serious man. That's probably a Fraser father. I took him to all of the wildest things that you could possibly. Like I took him to ACMS. ACMS I took him to John Luke Roberts. I took him to a whole bunch of like... Paul Kari, did you see it? He was the craziest thing I saw at Fringe this year. Paul is a delightful man. I did not take him to Paul Kari, ah. but uh, yeah, Paul is yeah, wild. So good. Uh, and then uh, as a reward, we went um, to the highlands of Scotland afterwards and we were driving along and Dad told me a dirty joke. He told the you first time in my life. Your dad, my Mr. Dad, Fraser. Mi- Professor Fraser. Professor Fraser, please order, call me sir. Like member that of the Order of Australia, Professor Fraser. Nice. <laughs> Currently All the accolades. teaching for the UN. He Dirty joke. Me the first time in my whole life. It I, was very funny. I don't want you to repeat the joke. No. I want, I want an air of mystery, but we'll, how'd it go? Was uh, he good? It was good. It was pretty good. It was good. Re- offensive? Uh... Borderline, Borderline, which is, which is what it wow. should be, right? Which yeah. is you want a dirty joke to be a little bit offensive, but not quite enough to be actually offended. Just yeah. a bit, a ri- bit risque. Just something that you know, if someone heard it out of context, you could be like, "Oh boy, no, that's sli- spicy." Sli- slightly oblique. Okay, it was beautiful. Oh man, was that, was that a special? Happy. Was that a special moment? Is it was that an like, incredibly special moment? Is that is that like the you know upper class Australian way of being like, "I'm proud of you." Yeah. <laughs> Here's a dirty joke. Oh my, no, my I had that. I had that some years ago when uh, he had one of his kind of old barrister mates at our house nice. and I was in the next room and the guy was like oh is that your daughter the one who was a lawyer and went to Cambridge <laughs> and then quit to become a comedian sort of joshing my dad yeah and my dad went I'm very proud of Alice and I was in the next room and I heard it and I was like ha oh. dude I had that um it was something on Facebook I think this year my dad my my dad commented on something I don't know if you realize it was a public comment but it was like a it was there. It was just like I'm very, uh, I'm proud of you, darling. Still calls oh. me darling. Oh, that's um, beautiful. Can't shake that, unfortunately. But yeah, I was like, you know, that is the nicest use I've seen of social media. Yeah. For my dad to overcome his like crippling masculinity to be like, I'm proud of you. I can do this as long as we're not in the same country, right? Yeah. Like it's all, it's all good. Um, well, I think you know now. Is, given given we've got the full back catalogue, I think it's probably time to say I'm sitting down with Alice Fraser. Mm-hmm. The the severely educated Alice Fraser. <laughs> I use that phrase to describe me sometimes, but you have kept it going. Aggressively. You've, you've retained an education. I've tried to run away from mine. <laughs> I've repressed my education like gay dudes in the 60s, you know, just like I'm closeted. Catch me in a book. Catch me in a closet reading a book. That's where, yeah. that's where I'm at. But you've, you've kept it going and you've come back. Hey, I love you no matter how much education you have. Thank you. I wish I could say that about myself. <laughs> it definitely affects how I feel about myself. But no, you, because we did similar things. You were law, law school? Yes. Law school, graduated. Graduated, got my practicing certificate. Worked for a bit. Worked in the, for a bit. In the widest of Australian law firms, mm-hmm. Allen's. Alan's Linklaters now. Alan's Linklaters now. They merged. Mm-hmm. Well, that is not very wide at all. You've got to stay proud and independent. That's what you got to do. <laughs> okay. So they've, and then you did that for a little bit. Then you went to Cambridge, as you mentioned. I went mentioned. to Cambridge before, yeah, but yes. So is that, is that your first England when you studied in Cambridge or had you been here yeah, before? Yeah, so I uh, lived at home through my uni career because my mum was sick. Yeah. Um, so Cambridge was the first time I'd been away on my own for like properly away. Uh, like no holidays no, through here? None. No. Uh, I mean, I'd come with family and stuff when we were younger. Yeah, right. But that was mainly for things like meditation courses and stuff. Um, 
And of course, of course, of course. You go to the UK for your meditation course. Uh, yeah, there's a meditation centre up in Wiltshire near Devizes. Um, that is the kind of in the tradition that my family follows. Your particular uh, strain of meditation. Of Burmese Buddhism, yeah. Burmese so, Buddhism, of course. Is there is there some rivalry amongst the Buddhisms? Is there any like car bombings or is that more of a... No, it's... A, okay, Christian thing. It's a, that is a much more Christian thing. <laughs> um, How do you compete as meditational courses? Like, Is there any kind of throwdown? I think there's just competing levels of quiet smugness. Ah, how's your one going? I'm very smug. <laughs> <laughs> and increasingly louder <laughs> about it. Over time, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so uh, the first time I was here on my own was was I went to Cambridge and I got you know flew and I got here and I found my college and I you know we, got my accommodation sorted where where they were putting me up there. Well, I I I just want to take the Cambridge thing a little slower because I don't know I got I got a friend who just studied there so I've seen it and it was not what I expected in terms of like a university right because like, mm-hmm. you come from like Australia a university is a campus. There's stuff on the campus. There's kind of walls. <laughs> and then you leave the university. Whereas Cambridge is like, there's like a campus and they built this town in between all the stuff. Yeah, more or less. So unlike Oxford, which was a functioning city before or it grew up around the university and right. was, is a, it's a proper city. Whereas Cambridge is kind of, you had a, quite a small town and then the colleges are massive. Yeah, and the different colleges are kind of self-contained little and, kingdoms, yeah. little fiefdoms, and they, you know, and have their rivalries. And there's like a hierarchy as well. Yes, absolutely. there's like there's like the top one, which is like built way back in the day, and some yeah, guy who invented evolution of, is there. Yeah, and like maths, which I didn't realize until I got there. I the only thing I knew before I got there was don't go to one of the colleges that is far from the center of town because it's a hassle. Right. And so you're I, thinking geographic. I literally location. Googled most central college, and that was the <laughs> one I applied for um, and got into. And it, it's because it's, you know, in the middle mm. of the town. And which one was that? Uh, Sydney, Sydney, Sussex. Sydney, Sussex. So you went from Sydney to Sydney, Sussex. Yeah, don't. This is good. That's, yeah. Is it, how, how does it rank, <laughs> the Sydney, Sussex? College is it? It's a boutiquey one. A um, boutique one. Yeah, <laughs> like your hipster Cambridge college. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not one of your kind of Kings or Trinity uh, right ones, which I found out once I got there were the the big dogs, St. Uh, Johns, and all of uh, cats. That there's a sort of a handful of Super Top and Pembroke, and then you kind of go down the ranks a little bit. But then you also have the newer colleges, and then you have women's colleges, and then you have grad colleges. There's a there's a there's a lot of different little areas that you can p- slot into but yeah. it's, it's like the size of the chapel right that's what i kind of noticed with yeah. cambridge is like you got a big old chapel you're number one well it tends to be yeah basically how slower. much money you have uh, yeah. and then they have gardens and then they have grounds and then they own huge tracts of property and land and all of this stuff it, it truly is a like terrifyingly intimidating place or beautiful if you find that if you if you're not it's both of those things. It, yeah. is te- it is intimidating. It's beautiful. You walk around, you see these incredibly lovely things. You're like, oh, that's a beautiful window. And they're like, yeah, that's Isaac Newton's window. And you're like, oh. <laughs> of you course. Know, they're just... The famous window maker, oh, Isaac Newton. look at that pond. Yeah, Byron used to swim in that pond. Like, just everything. There's a kind of a weight of history there that is... Yeah. Yeah, and this almost was oppressive. introduction to here. That was my introduction. Right. Introduction to the UK is just like, we're well, it was go. worse than that because I, I, I landed in the England. I went to the meditation center. All of my kind of, the they're like family, right? I've known them since I was a kid. So they're like a bunch of great aunts and uncles, slightly older than my dad. <laughs> so they're all super proud of me. Yeah. And then Virginia, who's like an incredible aristocrat, lovely lady, she drives me from the airport and she's I'm completely jet lagged out of my mind jet lagged and she is talking about her garden in the most English possible way and we get to her tiny little cottage and there's a guy working on the front step and she's like oh hello Joe how are you and he's like oh Miss Virginia she's like can I get you a cup of tea he's like you're too good to me it's like oh my god do you realize you're reading a script like yeah, it yeah, was, yeah it was like being in a book and that was, you're like, well, I guess this is what it's all like here. Well, then that's what it is like at Cambridge. It's like being in a That's book. what I mean, yeah. It's like you've you've read about the UK as like this kind of weird thing and then you've come here and just walked straight into yeah. it. Yeah, it, it, is, it is exactly like it's like if you walked into downtown Chicago and there's a guy leaning up against the wall with a fedora saying, hey, lady, your legs go up to here. Like it's... <laughs> 
it was so wild. And then I, so I got there, I sorted out my accommodation. I was kind of feeling a bit, um, I went for a little run and I felt like I had this moment on the run went going. For a, wait, you went for a run? Well, yeah, I've been like sitting you. on a plane for fucking 24 hours. See, the fact that you're like, yeah, of course I went for a run. I've been sitting on a plane for 24 hours, I think says more about you than I'll, I'll ever be able to say, you know, just like, I'm just like, I've just been on a plane for a long time. You know what I'm going to do? Exercise. You know what mm-hmm. else anyone's going to do? Just, they're going to sit at home. Everyone else just sits. After travel, you're just like, I want to run now and okay, get my so body up and up and moving again. No, wait, the run happens after this. So what happened before that was I went and had tea uh, on the recommendation of a friend. So I met somebody, someone was like, oh, you should meet this guy. So he was 94 years old, blind. <laughs> he had been at Cambridge his whole life, except for two years where he was a prisoner of war in a Japanese internment camp. Of course he was. And uh, he was a he was an honorary fellow at Cats College, and he kind of showed me around, as it were, and told me, you know, about Cambridge, which was wild. The ninety four year old blind man took you on a walking tour. No, 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 no. He just sort of showed me around okay, the sorry. college I and thought, stuff. I thought you just like he showed me around. He, he gave he's me like, You're tips. leading him, and he's like, "Where are we now?" We had a really Big nice chapel. Oh, Kings, right, Kings Chapel. We had a really nice chat, and. Uh, he did. He was very lovely, except somewhat racist, which I think you can kind of give him a pass. We passed some Korean people, and he was like, "Oh no, their voices give me the creeps," which normally you wouldn't really be okay with, except that the fact that his only encounter with people of you know Southeast Asian descent was having been in an internment camp. So I'll give him a pass on I, that. I think one. that's a pretty passable. It's yeah, like, yeah. I just don't like them as a people. It's yeah. like, why? Well, they prisoned me for two. Years. Okay. <laughs> yep. Valid, but I like it's the voices, like you know, these blinds. So it's like, yeah, yeah, just I that. like their voices. You're like, all right, <laughs> the way, yeah, just the that's a very niche thing to dislike, but sure, for yeah. sure, as a, as a blind man. And so then I went back and I, you know, found, got my little room and I went for a little run and I had this moment of like, oh, I am so far away from anyone who loves me, right? That moment of like, if I sprain my ankle, my brother or my father or my mum are like. 26 hours away minimum yeah so anyone like, who is like unquestioningly loves me is away it's like proper isolation yeah just that setting in yeah you're like just, oh wow this is a long way away yeah i'm alone yeah and in some ways it was a very freeing feeling and in some ways it was a daunting feeling but i thought i need to do something some kind of activity and so i walked into my college and in the chapel there was a little bill poster for an opera that night <laughs> in the chapel of my college being done by a community group. And it was Mozart's Cosi Fan Tutte, uh, which is a story about young people, basically. Did you know this before seeing the opera? We just have, do yeah, you have yeah, a working yeah. knowledge of opera? My mum okay. was a musician, so she was okay. like she used to play Mozart operas in the car. So it was kind sure. of my, very much my so upbringing. So it's familiar. Yeah, she played the cello and she was a, like, she was a proper musician. So yeah. I thought this will be nice. Mozart is kind of beautiful it's just really easy and beautiful music it's not like your kind of oppressive wagner stuff it's joyful uh and it was these like genuinely no one was under 60 in the cast it was a community group and they were in young people drag so there were these old men with like like (laughs) vibrantly brown wigs uh, strutting right. around, walking like young men, and they weren't very good singers. But Mozart is so beautiful that occasionally it would click in and just be transcendental, and then it would kind of go sour again. And right. it was yeah, it's just these old people. It was so sweet. It was how so, many people were watching this thing? Maybe maybe thirty or fifty, like not a huge number. Okay, because I kind of had this like huge crowd image. No, no good. It was in okay, quite so a small it's like it's chapel. small. It's kind of, yeah, got it. I'm, and I'm with uh, you. yeah, it was it was really lovely. Um, and surreal and that is surreal yeah it was really amazing and that was your first night that was, was this my before first or after night. the run this was after the run after the run so 94 94 year old t yep run yep opera senior citizen <laughs> opera <laughs> okay <laughs> and that's your first night yeah in the uk wow i mean and you can't you came back and i came back you came yeah. back but so wait so how how did you find Cambridge? Because like, as I said, I had a mate who went there. He kind of gave me, like, I went there a couple of times. I've done a gig up there. Like, well, what I was, was there your... as a grad, so it's a different experience, I think. Yeah. Um, I think if you're there as an undergraduate, it's much more kind of, um, you know, shaping your character. 
they do these kind of one-on-one -on -one tutorials and the whole structure of the college is much more tightly knit. Whereas as grads, it's all really fascinating international students. Like it was, I don't think I had a boring conversation the whole time I was there. All these people with like incredible backstories and from all around the world, you know, like I met a, a Russian Texan mathematician whose name was George and my friend <laughs> Nina, who when she was sick, I like came around to bring her some grapes and she was lying in bed reading a textbook on fluid dynamics. And I was like, oh, are you trying to catch up for an exam? And she's like, no, 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 I just don't feel like I know enough about fluid dynamics. Like it was wow. that kind of people. Have you ever felt like you don't know enough about fluid dynamics? Always. <laughs> but I've never felt like I needed to do anything about it. But every, every day I wake up and I'm like, I still don't know anything about fluid dynamics. Yep. And that's never going to change. It's never going to change. It's nice to have constants in this life. <laughs> It's reassuring, really, the, the lack of knowledge about fluid dynamics. So it was, it was this overwhelming situation, really. Yeah. Well, that was my, my thing was my friend telling me about those undergraduate um, people there. And that does sound like my, my main thing with Cambridge is I, I just I don't understand how anyone who went there can come out normal. I think. Is I, that fair? Is that just because like they have a cleaner Every day when yeah. you're 18. Who? That's going to make you expect that <laughs> for a while, you know? These are people who are learning about recycling. Yeah. Like, that was, that was my main kind of, like, I was like, wow. Like, this is another place. Like, this is another world. Well, it depends on the college you're in and so on and so forth. Like, it could mm. just be someone who comes around and takes the bins. Mm. Um, it depends on the college and the norms of that particular place. Yeah. As to how much that kind of servanty culture is part of it. <laughs> there is a servanty culture here in general though. Yes, very much, very much and, and and a very protected class system as well. And maybe maybe of course obviously in Cambridge and Oxford and those places it's exaggerated by these traditions, but I remember talking to uh the lady I at my college and offering to give her a hand, and she was genuinely offended. Yes. This she is, was like, know your place kind of thing. This is the same thing that everyone's told me whenever they've tried to help. It's been like, you don't need to do that. I'll do it, and they get offended. Well, yeah, because it's it's a, a pride in that place, this I, this sense of identity that's that's got to do with a like a, an abstract thing, your position in society, but that's your domain as well if someone's encroaching on that or telling you, telling you that they don't need you. It's, right. It kind of breaks down a fundamental social order. And, of course, in modern age, it's nowhere near as inflexible as it used to be. It's not, but it's it's not still, anywhere near. It's still there. There's still like a group of people there are in the UK people, that rely on that. Yeah, there are certain living. people who have that tradition and their mother was a of that class and their father was of that class and their great-grandparents and, you know, all the way back. There is a, a pride in that as well. Yeah, that it's like, don't you tell me that you can empty a bin <laughs> like I can empty a bin. Well, more... I've got seven generations of bin emptying. We were there before bin bags, all right? We know. Well, maybe, maybe like, say a, a nuclear physicist comes to one of your shows, right? Somebody who's got a Nobel Prize in nuclear physics. Sure. And they come up on stage and go, look, I can do the comedy, it's fucking easy. I mean... But they, they, would, they would then quickly prove that they cannot. You, well, yeah. you, you'd assume. I mean, I don't know. Maybe nuclear physicists have like mad charisma. Like, I don't, I don't know. But I mean, with the bin but there thing, are, But I mean, the point is that there are people who are good at certain things or that's their yeah, domain. Yeah, yeah. Look, I don't, I, I'm, I'm projecting a whole lot of stuff onto this. I don't actually understand it. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I, do you think you'll ever understand it though? Like, that's, I think coming from Australia, you just, you can't really pick up on that. Like, that's just the thing that I'm like, I... I'll always offer to help. Well, we have an aggressive egalitarianism in Australia that has a dark side to it as well. And what, what's, the, what's the dark side, do you think? The dark side is don't put your head above the parapet, tall poppy syndrome. Who the fuck do you think you are? Right, okay. You, like... think you're, you think you're special? <laughs> that, it's that. It's the don't get out of line, you know. Yeah. That mateship and, and egalitarianism also means that Anybody who wants to be different or anybody who's trying to be special or anyone who's, you know, they remember the, like being a tryhard at school. 
Yeah, but those guys are shit, though. <laughs> <laughs> See, you've internalized it. God, man, I... People who want to be better than they are are knocked down a peg in Australia. No, absolutely, man. I look, I agree with that a hundred percent. That is like, if there is one thing that coming here has made me do, it's like try and get rid of that. Yeah, like I'm, I'm trying to be like less like, come on, pull your head in, mate. Like, yeah, that's. Like that's a strict, like about yourself as well as everybody else. Well, it's something that I've kind of been on the pointy end of a lot of times because I'm a big believer in trying and failing. I'm a big believer in going beyond your capacity in, in doing something that you cannot do and then getting closer to being able to do what you want to do. Like if I get 80% of the way to where I'm trying to get to, that's still way further than I would get if I didn't try. But do you... Do you think Australia has a thing against people trying? Yes. Or d- trying? Yes. But, like, what about... I mean, I always use sports as an analogy because, like, I'm a bottom feeder and sports is what I spend most of there my time There are exceptions made about. for sports. Yeah, that's pretty much sport, isn't it? But, but that, like, that's because about... sport is a team thing generally as well. But if you're, like, an electrician and you're, like, putting in extra effort and stuff, no one's going to begrudge you the work. Like, I, think it's, I think it's more... But if you're st- an electrician who, say, listens to classical music... Yeah, but that's just because you're a wanker, not because Yeah, see what I mean? Of course he's not a wanker. <laughs> What's to say an electrician can't enjoy classical music? I, th- I don't think anyone should listen to classical music. That's, <laughs> that's just me. I'm not saying it's just electricians. I'm like, look, if but you are it, a classical musician, stop listening to What it ends up it. meaning is that the uh, elite in Australia, the people who are wealthy or who have access to culture, then because they feel this resentment from the mainstream become in turn like really contemptuous of mainstream Australia and you have this big divide it's not it's you know if you go to Italy there'll be a plumber and he'll be at the opera like it's it's a much more it's much less kind of rigid in some ways yeah I mean I I definitely agree with that but just like but how many Australians are going to opera like well no I mean it's a massively elitist thing I'm opera isn't necessarily the best example but do you the think there's point- any status in opera in Australia, though? Like, I, if someone went to the opera, I wouldn't be like, oh, you must be rich. I'd just <laughs> think you're a wanker. Like, yeah. I'd just be like, you're into opera. All right, whatever. Yeah, but I don't this get idea of someone Latin, being a wanker, you know? like, why? Why would you – you wouldn't say someone was a wanker if they liked, I don't know, fucking deep water snorkeling or whatever. I mean, look, I'm a bad person to have this conversation with. There is probably no activity that I'd be like, what a wanker. <laughs> it's like rock climbing. Everyone's doing rock climbing now. Have you seen that? <laughs> why? why and why are you telling me why does it matter what people do because it does it doesn't though (laughs) it doesn't look i don't know i no no look i this is this is exposing nothing more than like the mess that is my internal monologue (laughs) like when i when i just scroll through instagram see someone rock climbing and sigh well it's 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 it is one of those things right where i know for a fact that in australia there are people who don't like the kind of work that I do. As, just as because in comedically. This in is comedically, doing comedically, sure. And, but not, not just that they don't like what I do, because that's normal. You know, there are going to be people who like you and people who don't like you, but that they don't like the fact that I'm even trying to do it. Well, so we, when we're talking about this, we should give some context to people who aren't familiar mm-hmm. with your work. I mean, like, surely there's a couple of people who aren't right on top of Alice Fraser's back catalogue <laughs> out there. Nobody uh, knows who the fuck I am. No, that is, that, is un, that is untrue. I know who you are. That is why you're here. Um, and because we're old friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, so you're, would, would you say like more of a festival-based, hour-long intellectual comedy? Is, is that a fair assessment? Or like yeah, I, I much don't... more meaningful than someone like me? I'm not a huge fan of the wankers. term intellectual comedy, but... I, I would say that there is like a a narrative edge to what I do. There's something in it where, and I mean, this is partly just because I'm not ever going to be the funny guy who walks on stage and gets a laugh before he hits the microphone. I am not naturally funny. Oh, it's really hard to be that guy. Though. But what I am naturally relatively good at is uh, structure, telling stories, like narrative structure where you, you start and you introduce these kind of ideas and then you go away from them, you come back to them, you go away from them, you come back to them and you're building something that at the end for the audience feels satisfying. They feel like they've got something. Um, yeah, they've, they've seen a thing. Yeah, they haven't just seen a bunch of jokes. They've seen a thing. That there's a thing, that there's a different angle, that there's something 
there's a shift, you know, that that's the best feeling in the world for me is, you know, when you're in a suburb and then there's another suburb and you know both of those suburbs, but you know they joined at that particular street. <laughs> Do you know that feeling? I mean, I, I don't know, but I can imagine what it feels like but you're now. you're like, ah, oh, and of your, course. Whole, like, that, that, your whole sense of the world shifts slightly. <laughs> You know, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you, like, just, you didn't realize these two things were connected. Yeah, that little moment, and that's one of the best feelings in the world, and in my head, like that's one of the nicest feelings of just a sudden, like a connection or a click or something that you hadn't connected or a perspective that you hadn't seen before. Where you go, oh, now I, now I get it. But is, is that so? If I can give just even one of those moments in a show. So, like, is in sorry, just to get to that analogy like in this in you're helping people understand the connection between the two things or showing them that connection exists well it depends either you're talking about two things that exist and bring them together or you're and it, again it's not two things this is an oversimplification but sure. the structure of the show uh, is a proxy for that so i'll create one suburb and then i'll create <laughs> the other suburb and kind of just in passing you don't know you almost ideally don't notice it happening there are little details in each of the suburbs that, you know, I mention in passing, mm. you know, little little milestones, little, you can see that roof over that horizon and you can see, and then all of a sudden the two come together and you can see that roof from over here. And there is that feeling. That's a really clumsy analogy for what I'm <laughs> no, trying no, to do. No, no, it's fine. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm just purely because like, obviously I've seen many of your shows. I know exactly what you're talking about, <laughs> but I want, I want people to be like, <laughs> I want people to listen to this be like, all right, this is why she needs to not do it. Well, in, this is why in Australia it's been a problem, yeah. basically. Well, I think, I think because in Australia no one really wants to be told anything. Well, I think that's a weird thing we have. Like it's like, no, 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 don't tell me. Well, in Australia it's, I mean, it's not even that, I, like I have a, a base of people who come watch my shows in Australia. I can make a living in Australia off comedy. Mm. But there are as many people in London and surrounding boroughs as there are in the whole of Australia. And more than that, it's an educated comedy audience. You had, like, say what you like about nepotism. If there's a downside to nepotism. It's fucking a horrendous thing. But for years and years and years, there was a direct channel from Cambridge and Oxford performing societies, the, the Footlights, which I was in, and Nuts at, at, at Oxford, which went straight into the BBC. And that meant that the BBC was putting out really weird comedy, comedy that would never work on a commercial spectrum, really weird, smart um, you know, Monty Python. Yeah, yeah, that, like the, kind, kind, the of kind of thing that wouldn't work in a club where people don't really know why they're there yeah, and there's it's no... just part of the entertainment. So you had this kind of ambitious comedy. BBC is, is funded by television licenses, so it's not funded by the government directly in the way that the ABC is. So they can do stuff. Yeah, they've got room to move. They've but got room that, to do weird stuff. That means that your average person on the street has an idea of comedy that is much broader than the average person on the Australian street. Yeah, where absolutely. Where your kind of access to comedy is the footy show, Auntie Jack, well, no, that, historically speaking. what Wasn't that hilarious? Sorry, just like vague Australian side note. The NRL footy show is cancelled now. Mm. Like it's ended after like 16 seasons, which means there is no longer a television show in Australia where you can do stand-up comedy. Yeah. That was the only one. They did it on Tonightly time. for a Tonightly little bit. Tonightly for like six months. Yeah, and then but they I mean, got like long standing. That's like that is the only show. Like there was Hey Hey It's Saturday. Yeah. And then there was the Footy Show. Yeah. And then there was this one show that kind of gave it a crack for six months, then immediately got cancelled. And then you've also got now here in in the UK, you've got these panel shows, this history of panel shows where you have people, comedians coming on and they do stand up and they do. I mean, the UK and they do banter. There's, there's so much comedy. Like you, you can just you can get it so easily. Whereas in Australia, you really have to look for it. And there's so much comedy and so many different kinds of comedy. And of course, now the internet is breaking down these norms. But I'm just talking about the audience that's kind of. Already it established, exists, ready established. to go. I mean, what about sketch? In Australia, if you do sketch, everyone thinks you're weird. Yeah, unless you do it on YouTube and make a billion followers. That's true. Make a billion followers. A billion followers. And so what that means is it's much more normal. You've got this kind of music hall history as well, the panto history as well, which means that your average office worker will turn to their friends and go, hey, do you want to see a movie? Do you want to go to dinner? Do you want to go see some comedy? Well, they just go out. They, they go out here. They want to see stuff. They go see some comedy. And there's, there's so many West End shows on all Australia, the time. In Australia, you don't really go see comedy unless you're a comedy fan. 
No, of course not. It's Unless you're like not... an office Christmas party yeah. once every five years. They're like, this is what we're doing this time. Or, you know, a Groupon ticket for you and a date. Like, yeah. it's just not a normal thing to do. And so what that means, all of that, all of those things coming together means that there is a bigger audience and then that bigger audience has a bigger idea of what comedy can be. Yeah, and for someone like you who is being ambitious in what they put on the stage. Well, that, you know, occasionally what I do is borderline not comedy, you know, that it's... that. <laughs> well, I mean, look, let's not get into what's comedy, what isn't comedy. That's been a tricky year for that. <laughs> do they need to laugh? Who knows? I just know that I, I don't have an opinion. Um, yeah, so, yeah, like, but that's what I mean. Like, it's an ambitious thing. So, you're like, it's much easier to do like a show that's more than just like set up, punch, laugh. Well, I don't have to come on stage and immediately make myself non-threatening. I don't have to come on stage and, and shit my shit on myself and make myself feel like, oh, it's okay. You don't have to worry. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to try to be too smart at you. <laughs> you know, I'm not trying to be but, anything. I'm just talking yeah. about the things that I'm interested in and, but like as I said, you are a severely educated person, and mm. like any Australian person listening to this would be able to tell that from your accent immediately. Yeah, but they can't tell here, which is great. I know that's what, dude. I love it too because in Australia, mine's still pretentious. Yeah. Like whereas here, everyone's like, "Mate, that is a rough accent." <laughs> it's yeah. like you must you must own singlets, singlets. You know, like that's that's like that's <laughs> you where do it's own at. several singlets, but they're ironic singlets. singlets. Yeah, they're all they're all fun. They're all like you know. Hashtag feminism singlets, <laughs> just like just a weird clash of singlet. Um, but no, yeah, I, I find that great here as well. Because in, in Australia, like it is, if people think you think you're better than them, yeah, that's a, it's over. Yeah. They will not listen to a word you say. Yeah. Whereas here, you even go to like those weird little villages where like you're like, these are rural areas, it's going to be pretty rough. And no. They don't. They don't care what you think. Yeah. They're just right? kind of like, we're doing our own thing. We've been here for centuries. Yeah. Like, why would we care some blow-in for like 20 minutes, you know? Well, it, maybe that is an an upside of the class system. Like, people know where they are. Maybe it's a downside. I, look, I don't know. I sound, <laughs> I've, I realize that I've sounded like I've been supporting an, a, a stratified class system, which I absolutely don't. I mean, but- I, I don't think anyone's taken away from this. Like, yeah, that Alice Fraser lady, she's into... Intellectual comedy and she loves classes. Yeah, Just keep, fucking... keep them separate, as separate as possible. Calm down, feudalism fan. <laughs> feudalism <laughs> Fraser, that's your new nickname. <laughs> I like it. No, but yeah, I mean, that's what I was going to talk to you about because you, you had like the most kind of bizarre introduction to England through Cambridge and like just such a specific thing. Yeah, it was the England out of books, Yeah, right? It was just like Mr. Darcy, Mrs. Fraser, like that kind of vibe. Yeah, and that was wonderful and really weird. And, of course, England is much more diverse and interesting than that. But it was a really, like, as someone who was brought up reading books about this place, it was fantastic to kind of have that live theme park experience of it. Yeah, for sure. It's like when you go to America and you eat at a diner and somebody gets shot, you're like, man, this is sick. This is exactly (laughs) what I've looked for this whole time, you know? No, I I completely agree with that. But it's like, but I found it funny that then like after that, would you say this has always kind of been a thing for you in Australia? Because in my head, like I was, I was thinking about this the other day. It's like, you are as close as it comes in my brain to like, like elite Australian society, you know, like, like as as far, (laughs) not, not in terms of like how you are to anybody. Cause I think anybody would say like one of the nicest, kindest people, blah, blah, blah. Thank you. I love that it said blah, blah, blah. I can't (laughs) even finish a compliment. If you're wondering wondering what Australia is like, that's it in one sentence. Um, but yeah, just like privately educated. No, really? You went to public school? I went to a public selective. Oh, well. So this is the thing, right? In that, I've had oh, I've had this weird kind of mix in my life of massive privilege, but also not ever really very much money. Yeah, well, I mean, and- I think I can say this in two words: Jewish Buddhist. Mm-hmm. I think that just covers it. Well, also, like my mom was sick, so a lot of the kind of, of family course. stuff went there, and 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 you, you were know, like a primary went- carer, kind of uh, for quite well, a while. We all we all. Uh, helped um but yeah it, it was this thing of that was kind of the focus and um and then you know i, I went i went to cambridge on a scholarship bursary thing so i was 
genuinely uh, on four pounds a day, which worked out actually to be about two pounds a day because I'd saved two pounds to go to the formal dinners, which were every um, couple of weeks. I've heard about these formal dinners. They seem yeah, which like are a... you go in your gown and they're like these fancy four course dinners and it was just ridiculous. It's like, you know, the the closest lazy proxy would be Harry Potter. Like it's like that. Um, but... Actually, my, my girlfriend went to one of them and she was like, it's like Downton Abbey in here. And yeah, just, yeah, my, exactly. everyone just kind of gave her this look and she's like, it is. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what you want. So, but, but then a lot of these, a lot of the privileges of wealth are not even about having money. They're about having access to stuff. So I've always had that side of things where like... The actual financial side. It becomes irrelevant at a certain point. If you don't have money but you have access, you don't need the money. It only occasionally comes up. Yeah. So, like, you know, it comes up if you can't you can't join polo club or whatever. I just I broke my mouth. Because you don't have a horse, but <laughs> I don't, yeah. you know you what can go and hang horse? out with oh, it's those in the, people. It's in the shop. It's getting getting reshoed. Yeah. It'll be here next week. It's like, exactly. Alice, you've been saying that for three months. It's like, fine. Mm-hmm. I don't have a horse. <laughs> <laughs> I've been busted. But yeah, I just like because this is if you look. About Australian prime ministers, which I guess is like the closest thing we have to like an upper class mm. thing. Like just like the people who are in power and then there's like mining money and mm. there's like the print media. That's kind of like the media mogul, the mining mogul, and then the head of government is kind of our closest. all of those people pretend to be y- your every man. Yeah, of course. You know, that's... Like Kerry Packer. We are the o- I think we're one of the only you know, cultures in the world that will elect a leader and then go, who the fuck do you think you are? Like, yeah. who, who gave you a fucking... <laughs> but isn't that amazing? It's yeah. just like, look, mate, you can make the decisions, but don't act don't like... Don't get above yourself. Yeah, don't act like you're in charge. Look, right? I'm going to put your, I'm gonna put my life in your hands, but fucking yeah. d- don't act like you got any power. It's, it is a weird thing. And like I said, there's a great, there's a greatness about that. There's a really lovely thing about that, that we do have like a really... And that, you know, I'm not going to go into Australian history, but, you know, you had convicts under martial law, which was British law, and it was, by definition, Australia was the most criminal country in the world because everyone... It was a big know, prison. Yeah, yeah, it was a big prison. And then as we established our own legal system um, and kind of drew down our own common law and started fixing up our legislation so it wasn't, you know, UK legislation is not always going to be applicable in Australia... Mm. Then we had our own police force from among the people. And within, by the second generation, it was the most law-abiding country in the world. Yeah, that's kind of carried forward in a weird way in that we're very regulated. We are very regulated. And it's an interesting thing because there are these there are these terrible abuses in the police system, of course. Of you course. know, you just have this. I mean, that's everywhere. Everywhere um, in the world, wherever people have power, they'll misuse it. But you know, particularly in places like far north Queensland or, or Darwin where you've got... More, more remote areas with larger indigenous communities. Where you've just got yeah. terrible, terrible abuses. Um, but in a, like in a city on an average night out, a policeman will walk down the street and you don't realise what a privilege this is until you go to somewhere like the US where the way a policeman will approach you is threatening. Right. You know, so if you are walking down the street in the US and you go down a, a street you're not meant to go on, whatever it happens to be, they will come at you, ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. Like, and they've <laughs> got their hand on their gun. Like, that is yeah, right. fucking, like, that is... I, I find the, the big gun thing here weird. Yeah. Because like, in Australia, to see a cop with a big gun is very strange, like, very unsettling. Like, if you've got, like, a... they got a handgun. Yeah. Pretty much that's it. Whereas here... Like Liverpool Street Station, which is like a big thoroughfare, and I guess obviously because of the things that have happened here, mm. they've like you know they keep the train stations pretty tight. Like in peak hour, there's just four dudes with like machine guns, yeah, just sitting around, and I'm like, I don't like that. No, that makes me feel weird. Yeah, the state has a monopoly on power, but could you not swing your dick around about it? Yeah, like 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 Paris, just put your wang away, all right? Just don't don't put it in my face. Yeah. You're not feeding a baby with that gun. Yeah, but even here it's better than other places, you know. Yeah, I mean, like in Europe it's just like every cop has a big, big gun. Just, well, I mean, they, I really, think- really, the, I think the biggest 
the biggest distinction that is worth making and one of these one of these rights that we fought so hard for and now are being just flushed down the toilet is in England or in Australia a policeman can say I'd like to see your papers and you can go no whereas right. in other countries someone goes show me your identity card and you have to I did not even know that was a thing yeah so unless someone has a warrant in your ha- to get get into your house or to see something of yours, what's your name? What's, what business is it of yours? Am I a person of interest? Are you going to arrest me? No? Well, good night. Like you don't have. You don't have to. You don't have to unless, you know, and of course, you know, there are legal things where you're, you, you've been accused of a crime, you can't just fuck off. But just if a policeman goes, hey, man, what's your name? You go, what business is it of yours? Rather yeah. than, oh, sir, let me, like... And even on a practical side, they're not going to, you know, yeah, but, hold you uh, against the wall, force imprison you. I mean, but, but if they, 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 they could do all of those things, and often they do, but all of those things are against the law and there are remedies in, in the courts against them. Yeah. So there, this is not to say that people don't abuse power that they have, that the people don't overstep power, that you don't get policemen, particularly with people of colour, just breaking those laws with impunity. But the fact that those laws exist is huge. Yeah, just that they're on the book, that does make it makes a it a makes difference. a difference. There is a channel of, of of appeal. There is a resource. You can be outraged and you can have, you know, the court system behind you if you have the resources to then pursue that. <laughs> or if someone comes in on your side or if you know Yeah, yeah, for sure. Whereas like just in other places it's like, no, like that's their right as police officers and you will comply. And, but the, because those, just because like, having those rights is actually much, much more of a big deal than, than people. Yeah, well, I think. Like uh, people died for those rights. Yeah, and it, it changes the mindset as well. Like I think, you know, in the States you see like the way people kind of deal with the police is like they are a big, scary thing and you run away. Whereas in Australia you can just be like, hey man, do you know where that thing is? Yeah. And they're like, oh yeah, it's just down there. You're like, all right, cool. Yeah. And that's it. I mean, yeah, I've I've had some like it's so funny with police. I've always every time I've been like, you guys are all right, you know? Then I've just had like some dickhead like just completely abuse their like small amount of power, like stuff with like driving things. Yeah, like, of course. I had this lady just like it was like two of them, they like kind of pulled me over because like I was giving my girlfriend's friends a lift home from their work Christmas party, right? Yeah. And they kinda of see a bunch of drunk people come in and they must assume I'm drunk. And I'm like, nah. And they pull me over and they're like, have you ever drank anything? And I'm like, no. And then just like, sir? And I'm like, no. Like, I just said no. And they give me the breathalyzer, get nothing. And I'm like, told you. And then they like go back to their car and like, you realize your car's unregistered? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's definitely registered. Like, I've sorted this out this week. And they're like, well, according to us, those number plates, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like, look, it's definitely registered. Um, I'll go to the RTA on Monday. I'll fix it out. I'll fix it up. Not a problem. She's like, no, you got to stop driving that car right now. And I'm like, but I'm in a driveway. Like you guys have pulled me over. Can I just move it? Like park it somewhere? And they're like, no. Yeah. And I mean, that's, it's just like, you know, that thing we just like. Ugh. That's stupid bureaucratic bullshit. But also, you can go to the RTA, you can go to this person, like you can appeal the fine. There, are, There is... Well, no, I didn't end up paying the fine. I just waited for 20 minutes and moved the car, yeah. obviously. But like, obviously. You know, obviously. But there are countries where you'd have to hand over $500 to get out of that situation. Oh, Brian, that, like, I know that's not a good thing, but wouldn't you like slightly more bribery in your everyday life? Just a little bit, just to grease the wheels on things. Well, they do have that now, sort of a formalized bribery with things like train tickets, uh, train fare evasion stuff. They Wait, just, is that here? No, in Australia, they've got that thing where like if you're on the tram in, I've seen this in, in Melbourne, someone doesn't have their tram ticket and they're like, that's a $200 on the spot fine and they'll pull out their card reader and you're like, that is just bribery. <laughs> like, that is just 100% the government making money today. Yeah. Oh, man. Australia is real gross with that. Our fines are so high. Like comparative to here, I got a driving fine here and it was like 180 quid or something, like 120 quid. Mm. Whereas in Australia, that like thing, driving an unregistered vehicle, she got me, she gave me two tickets, mm. like one for driving unregistered and the other one like just the exact same thing but twice and it was like $750 each. <laughs> and I was like, get the fuck out of here. Like that's crazy. Yeah. 
Like it's like fair evasion. Like in Australia, it's like what, like ninety or one hundred and ten? Two hundred dollars on the spot fine. Two hundred dollars in Melbourne, right? And then yeah, in Germany, it's like twenty euro. Yeah. It's re- yeah. Ugh. <laughs> you get a little bit shitty about the Australian government every now and again. I think coming from Sydney, you just get a little bit annoyed because they're just like, everyone wants to live here. Yeah. Our fines are going to be fucking massive. Yeah. And you're like, ugh. It's a privilege, man. You're paying for schools and roads. Yeah, but I don't, I don't have kids yet. <laughs> I can pay half because I'm paying for the roads. <laughs> I have a oh, car man. but no kids. Re- you, know, you know the baby bonus thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Baby bonus. I reckon what they should do, because, I mean, there's a couple of factors that are playing into this and I've got to go Wait, is, in a is minute. It, is it still on? Huh? Is it still on the baby bonus? I thought I they got rid know. of it. I thought they scrapped it. I don't know. But <laughs> the point being that they should give you a tax cut for every milestone your child passes. <laughs> like an incentive to make a good kid? Because women overall, they have a penalty if they have kids. Financial penalty, they tend to get, you know, have, find it harder to get back in their careers. They tend to have less superannuation overall. All of those things. Right, yeah, all these factors, yeah. All these factors that mean that women, particularly women who have children, end up with less money at the end of their careers than men. So say your kid finishes school or goes into university or goes into an apprenticeship or somehow indicates that they're going to be a functional member of society, you immediately get a tax cut for the rest of your life. That's pretty good. Yeah, no, it, it sticks through all. And then if your kid is like in juvie, no tax cut for you. No tax cut. Does it go up? Yeah. You got to like, you got to pay a little bit extra. No, not, not, not extra. You just don't get, I think incentives are always better than punishments. <sighs> Spoken like a true, lovely Buddhist lady. <laughs> Don't punish, just incentivize. Um, so, sorry, did you say you got to move I, soon? I've got to move. I've got to go to the Goop store and do some Vox Pops for an audible documentary I'm doing on wellness. <laughs> 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 we could have just got you to say that and ended the interview there. Just yeah. like, yeah, so it's this uh, Vox Pop on wellness that I'm doing I, for I, a documentary. I'm going to go to the Goop store and do my favorite Goop store game, which is where you put your hand over the price tag and guess how much it costs. What What is a Goop store? Uh, I don't think I've Gwyneth seen a Goop Paltrow's, store. Uh, oh, I did not realize that was a chain. Well, it's not. It's a pop-up store. Okay. But I'm doing this documentary on like wellness, wellness. and what, what it is and what the kind of over-commercialized bullshit side of it and whether there is actually anything to it and where it's come from and blah, 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 blah. Proper documentary. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm going to go to the Goop store and t- Vox Pop people and ask them what they think wellness is. Right. Can I... What can do I, you think wellness is, What Daniel do I Michael think wellness think? is? I think it's a 20%. Uh, 20% on whatever price you're willing to pay. It's 20% up. At the Goop store, it is way more than that. She has like little rose quartz eggs for Kegel exercises and they're like 60 pounds. Well, like you insert the rose quartz. Yeah, they work, you know, they're to work your muscles. Yeah. The, I mean, those rose quartz eggs, you can get them at the market for two pounds. She is selling them for like 60 pounds. It's stuff like that level of markup. It's very funny. Yeah, I mean, thirty pounds for a lip gloss. the the best uh, The best I've seen with like the kind of gourmet wellness, like it's all that same kind of. How can we make middle class people pay more for shit? Yeah, right. Um, the best I saw was a pizza joint. It had two menus: had the list of pizzas, I had the list of gourmet pizzas, and it was the exact same list except <laughs> the gourmet pizzas. They just had an adjective to describe <laughs> the ingredient. <laughs> and it was a four dollar difference in price. That's amazing. I'll never forget it. I mean, the whole thing is, I mean, this is the thing, like, in terms of actual happiness, there are certain scientific facts, like pro-social spending is one of the best things you can do for your overall wellness, right? She's giving money to charity or spending time and energy on good things on the people around you. Mm. So there's all this bullshit on Instagram where it's like, take a bath and, you know, Himalayan, whatever it is. Yeah, get your stick. salt candle on. Like Your salt lamp, Himalayan maybe, salt lamp. There we go. You know, Maybe instead of that, you could talk to a homeless person for 15 minutes. But, like, they're weird, though. <laughs> They've got weird views. They don't smell as good as Himalayan salt. I reckon that would be really funny to just, like, give homeless people all this wellness stuff. I'm like, what the fuck am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> it's just like, mate, it's a, it's a relaxing face mask. Just mate, use it. you can it. sell that for $120. <laughs> yeah, the Goop store? That'd be so... Oh, man. There are... Have you found homeless people here are the most polite you've ever met in the world? I've never seen anything like it. Like in the US, if you're a homeless person, you, you'll barge into a restaurant and be like, can I have some money? Mm. And you'll be like, no. Then they'll just yell at you for like 10 minutes and everyone will just kind of, you know, 
act like nothing's happening. <laughs> like when your uncle says something racist, you know, everyone just kind of eyes forward. Let's just wait for it to end and move on, right? And here, it's just like, hey, can I have some money? And you're like, oh, sorry, I don't have any cash. And they're like, okay, have a good day, sir. Thank you so much. And you're like... Maybe it's that class system again. Oh, got it. I never thought <laughs> feudalism would be where I came out of this episode with. I'm oh. sorry. I'm really not pro it. I know you're not pro. You just you understand it and you look at there being benefits, which most people don't. Most there's people are like, nothing, class system, boo. There's nothing that exists that doesn't have benefits. Like, this is the thing. You don't go to a heroin addict and go, heroin's bad, because they'll be like, yeah, but also it's really good. Makes me feel good. <laughs> yeah, you just have to go, okay, I know it makes you feel good. Let's see what else we can do that'll make you feel good so you don't need to have this good feeling that will also kill you. So you reckon, you reckon there's no... But nothing where there's a pros and cons column. Nothing has a not, not a single thing in the pros. Any like when I'm talking about like human behaviors, Any yeah, human, human habits, all these things where you're like, God, that's terrible. It's ruining everything. You're like, Yeah, yeah, okay, yes. That's but an interesting point. I guess you could make a case for anything. Everything that people habitually do has to have an upside. Why would you? Why otherwise would you do it? Even those people who fucking flagellate themselves with whips and chains. I mean, yeah, but that's obviously an upside. It makes you feel alive, <laughs> yeah. right? Gets like, you back in the game. You know. Well, wait, I was, I was going to say one, one, last, one last thing before we get out of here. Mm -hmm. You've been living here for what, kind of four years on and off? On and off, spending like one month more per year over yeah. here. Is this, is, this, is this a gradual move? A gradual move to the UK full time? Well, my brother's over here, my twin brother, and he's about to have a baby or his wife's about to have a baby. Yeah, uh, the auntie, the auntie power, the auntie pull is strong. Yeah, and since my mum died, it's kind of like my dad would come over if we were both over here, I think. Well, he'd live here. Yeah, why not? Yeah, fair enough. There's a meditation centre here. <laughs> what else do you need? What else do you need? If you've got a meditation centre. He, he can teach for the UN, all of that stuff. Well, like just just on your pros and cons, why? What would pull you back to Australia? Because you, you're like you know a very um, ambitious and professional lady. I assume mm -hmm. here there's just so much more opportunity. Yeah. But like, I think in terms of quality of life, you can't really argue against Australia. Australia is easier. It is easier. It's easier to live in Australia, and the downside of that is that you know there's a ceiling on what you can do. Especially like if, especially if you don't want to compromise what you do, like if you don't want to go into breakfast radio, for example. That is so weird, isn't it? That's the that is the highest level of Australian comedy. It's kind of like if you want breakfast to have that, radio. if you want to have a nice life, and so maybe if I had kids or something, it's easy to have a nice life in Australia. Here, you don't really have a nice life. You have that kind <laughs> of life of extremes where there are these incredible peaks that you can achieve and. And and at the same time, you know, the air is poisonous and <laughs> none of the plumbing works. None of the plumbing does work. No. We, we got my, my landlady coming later today. Another plumbing issue. We had no hot water in the middle of winter. Oof. For like a week and a half. It's no good. In Australia, I've never had a plumbing issue. Yeah. Like everything's new. It's yeah. just like, yeah, it's fine. What are you talking about? Get some I mean, look, the there. pipes here are doing well considering they're a thousand years old. <laughs> So, so that, this shit was built by the Romans, man. Like yeah, I know. this is Doesn't not that terrify you. <laughs> like, I still, I'm still coming to terms with white people were here first. That's still <laughs> <laughs> every day. I wake up and I'm like, this is mine. I guess you know yeah. what I mean. Like this is this is this this belonged to me from the beginning. Does it make you feel virtuous that you've literally gone back to where you came from? I mean, no, because it means they were right when they were yelling it at me. <laughs> no, just I don't. I think the the weird the weirdest thing is just like I've just noticed my body, mm. just everything here is fine, like no more asthma, no more hay fever, like the heat. I don't. I never have to wear sunscreen. <laughs> it's really weird to come back to where your purpose built for. You know, <laughs> like it's just like I was I was like a ski that was being used for water skiing. Yeah, and it was like no no no, dude, get on snow. You're gonna love it. Yeah, like this is what you were made for. I don't know. Do you hear that as well? Just like your body's just like, yep, everything's fine here. Uh, I don't belong anywhere. I'm a bit of a mongrel. A bit of a mongrel? Get out of here. Come yeah. on. Look at that. Look at that goddamn accent. People would be like, <laughs> people wouldn't even know you're Australian. Uh, do, you, do you slide it in sometimes? Just like, no, I'm actually Australian. Like, what? But no, to, the, to English people, I sound very Australian. Still? Yeah. Get out of here. They think, I, they don't know me. They think I'm American. <laughs> They're very confused by me. 
All right. Um, do you have do you have anything that people we've been talking about your shows? I'd like to give people the opportunity to listen to them. Yes, where can I they have find the them? The trilogy, where the trilogy, which is a six part, um, three show extravaganza. It's called the Alice Fraser trilogy, and it's available on all sort of podcasting platforms that that you want to listen to it on. Also, if you have Amazon Prime, I have my, one of my shows, The Resistance, which is filmed, and that's also available on my website. If you don't have Amazon Prime, and what is your website? Uh, alicefraser.com alicefraser.com it was alice comedy fraser for a bit wasn't it yes and then you finally got the finally original got the alicefraser.com dude I was... alice, alice comedy fraser.com also works this is still lead you there nice yep. you've kept them both yep kept them both alice comedy fraser was one of my absolute favorite things i just thought it was stupid like i genuinely did it because i thought it was silly yeah and it is it and is so great. silly like it's such a wanky anyway it's like her middle name is comedy <laughs> ladies <laughs> and gentlemen <laughs> Um, but no, Alice, obviously, always very lovely to see you. Always lovely to see you too, man. All right, I'll catch you soon. All right, so that was my chat with Alice, old friend of mine, always good to talk to her, um, and always busy. That's the thing. She's the first guest so far that has been like, seriously, I need to get out of here. I've got something else on. And it's not even nighttime. That's the kind of comedian she is. She does stuff during the day as well, which I find incredibly impressive. Uh, but yeah, obviously she said she's got her trilogy out. We were trying to describe her comedy in that episode. What better way to figure it out what it's all about than to listen? Just give it a go. It's all on there. I think there's like I think it's on all good podcasting platforms and the ABC in Australia, which is our version of the BBC. ABC, BBC, real creative stuff there. Um, but yeah, it was um, nice to talk to her. One thing I didn't get to finalize, this is my, this is my big theory about Australia uh, in terms of like the elite of Australia. Um, I, think, I think like if you look basically at any of our prime ministers, they all, they all did exactly almost, well, almost exactly what Alice Fraser did apart from the, the comedy career. Other than that, they really nailed it. So they kick, they kick it off by getting privately educated and then they go to Sydney University where they study arts and law at the same time. Then they go to Cambridge or they go to Oxford as part of a scholarship program. And then they come back to Australia and in 20 years they're prime minister. Even, even the ones that don't seem like they did that, did that. It's real weird. And I think Alice, you know, this is, this is my tip. Obviously the comedy is going really well for her, but I think she's going to end up being Prime Minister at some point, if my theories are correct, Australia's first practicing Buddhist Prime Minister. That's something I want to see. I want a good Buddhist PM. I actually think about it. There's not a lot of not a lot of Buddhist people in politics. Don't think I can think of any. But hey, she could be the first. But uh, guys, that was the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'm still in Australia. Uh, I've got my show in Sydney coming up November 8th. If you know anyone, please send them along. Otherwise, check out Alice on like her comedy as the Alice Fraser Trilogy. Or you can catch her podcast. She's got one as well. It's called The Tea Cast with Alice Fraser. Uh, she's had a bunch of amazing guests on that. It's been running for ages. So check that out as well. Anyway, I'll see you guys soon. Cheers.